This is number eight in the final in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. As we come to the end of this study, I can honestly say that I have enjoyed making these tapes more than perhaps any other of the tapes I've made, either in the chronological or the theological section. And I suppose, if for no other reason, it is because of the fact that I need what I've been teaching myself and the fact that we are discussing the blessed ministry and person of the Holy Spirit. And even though he will not call attention to himself, yet the Father and Son, I believe, are pleased when a study is made on the part of the believer concerning the blessed Holy Spirit. And that is his ministry, of course, to honor the Father and to honor the Son. We discussed now the various ministries of the Holy Spirit, and we are discussing the gifts of the Spirit. We said that of the 18 gifts, a number of these, I believe, are sign and temporary gifts. The gift of apostleship, of prophecy, gift of miracles, the gift of tongues, and then, of course, if the gift of tongues was phased out at the beginning of the writing, or at the end of the writing of the Word of God, uh, then the gift of interpretation of tongues also, because you could not have that without the first. So, the gift of interpretation of tongues we have defined as the supernatural ability to clarify and interpret those messages uttered in an unknown language. Now, let us consider for just a few moments, in passing actually, the 11 or 12 permanent gifts. The reason I say 11 or 12 is I'm still not quite sure just where to place the gift of knowledge. Some believe that the gift of knowledge has to do with the writing of the Bible. If that's the case, it was phased out at the end of the first century. Some believe that this involves a supernatural ability to gather and arrange helpful biblical and secular facts. And if that's the case, it's the gift is for today. So at any rate, we will not treat that as one of the gifts today because we're not sure where to place it. The gift of wisdom obviously is for today, and the gift of wisdom seems to refer to the supernatural ability to rightfully apply and to spiritually employ scriptural information. Uh, some pastors have this gift. And some Bible teachers have this gift. Some factory workers, as children and men and women of God, have the gift of wisdom, of being able to apply uh, the scriptural principles to given situations. All right, then there is the gift of the discerning of spirits. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, and also John the Apostle in 1 John 4 speaks about the gift of discerning of spirits. This is the supernatural ability to distinguish between demonic, human, and divine spirits in another person. The Bible tells us to believe not every spirit, but to try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And some believers have this gift. Others, unfortunately, do not have the gift. The gift of discerning of spirits, to find out whether a movement or a person is of God. Of course, Peter and Paul and the other apostles apparently had this gift. And then there is the gift of giving, the supernatural ability to accumulate and give large amounts of one's finances, and not only one's finances, but one's time and one's entire life to the glory of God. We, of course, have in our notes an example of this, the late R.G. Letourneau, and that's the man who possessed the gift, uh, or the, uh, possessed the gift of giving as far as money is concerned. But there are many believers who give large parts of their times every, uh, to the church. Every pastor has experienced uh, faithful deacons and, and uh, custodians and whatever that just seem to be there when you need them. They're constantly there giving of themselves. 
and it's often because the Spirit of God has given them this gift, that of giving of their time and of their treasure back to the Lord in a way that the average Christian perhaps uh, would not or could not do. Uh, there are a number of instances that you can read in the notes of New Testament churches and individuals who had the gift of giving. And um, then there is the gift of exhortation, the supernatural ability to deliver challenging words. I think everybody who has heard Jerry Falwell, either on the old-time Gospel Hour radio program or the television hour, or who has heard him in person, would agree immediately, regardless of what they might think about him, that Jerry has the gift of exhortation. And I've heard him say this, if I've heard him say it once, I know I've heard him say it at least 250 times, that God determines the worth of a man not by his eloquence or his education, but how much it takes to discourage him. And it seems to be around Jerry is, is a very long, and a person is encouraged, and he's exhorted to... Uh, well, I've seen pastors come in here at the pastor's conference, our outreach conference, and they're discouraged, and they're perhaps uh, thinking of resigning their church, and they'll be here uh, for a few days and hear Jerry and the chorale sing, and, and they'll leave here ready to charge hell with a squirt gun because of the exhorting words they hear from Jerry and other men we feel on our staff that have the gift of exhortation. And then there is the gift of ministering, not the gift of a pastor. We refer to a pastor today as a minister, but the gift, the supernatural ability to render practical help in both physical and spiritual matters. Of course, Dorcas had this gift in the New Testament, and Phoebe had this gift, and thank God for those godly uh, deacons that I have known and had on my board and Sunday school teachers and and uh, church members that have the supernatural, they were always there when you needed them. And they had just the right thing. They, uh, well, they just, uh, they knew what you needed before you needed it, your, before you knew it yourself. They had the supernatural ability to render practical help. Then there is the gift of showing mercy. And this is the supernatural ability, we believe, to minister to those sick and afflicted. I've seen this so often that uh, as uh, a minister, there are people that can, and I'm there praying with other folks, perhaps in a hospital room, and there are other pastors or sometimes Christian doctors or Christian nurses or other people that can walk into the room and right away they just sort of turn a light on and they have the gift of showing mercy. They, don't, they sympathize with the patient and yet they don't uh, pity him and there's a difference. And they just know what to say. Uh, the supernatural ability to minister to those that are sick and afflicted. And there are others that come, and some ministers I know, and they certain, seem to turn a, a light off when they walk in. And they come in, and they're long prayers, and they try their best, but they just don't have this supernatural ability uh, of showing of mercy. And this response, of course, this displays itself in many other areas in the Christian church. The gift of ruling or of administration, and what a gift this is, and how this is needed in some of our large Bible-believing churches today. Uh, a few years ago, financially, we uh, sort of got behind the eight ball, and now, of course, God is miraculously allowing us to straighten the ship and to uh, bring this uh, totally into uh, the black, as it were, but I think one of the problems here is certainly unintentional on our part, but uh, we had not prayed, perhaps, uh, concerning those uh, gifted individuals for administration that we needed. And after much prayer, God then sent us a number of men uh, to, who had the gift of ruling, the gift of administration, of organization, of getting all these things in our church organized in our departments as it should be. And I think of those individuals in my own uh, realm of authority here as dean of the institute and uh, director of the Liberty Home Bible Institute and also vice president of the three schools that 
have given me the gift that I do not possess in some areas, the gift of administration. And then there is the gift of faith. Now, the Bible, and we need to understand this carefully, the Bible carefully distinguishes three kinds of faith. It describes three kinds of faith. There is saving faith, and that is given to all repenting sinners. The Apostle Paul told the Philippian jailer, he said, how can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? Believe, he said, have faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So all repenting sinners have this gift. But that's not the gift that we're talking about here. Then there's another kind of faith. There is sanctifying faith, and that's available to all believers. Saving faith is available to all sinners, Sanctifying faith is available to all believers. A number of passages tell us about this sanctifying faith. Paul says in Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, now notice, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then Ephesians 6, Paul says to take the shield of faith. And then Romans tells us, chapter 1, that the just shall live by faith. And so this faith is available to all believers. But there's a different kind of faith, a third kind of faith mentioned in the Bible, and that is called stewardship faith. Not saving faith, and not sanctifying faith, but stewardship faith. And this is, I believe, the gift that we have in mind when we discuss the 18 gifts of the Spirit. Stewardship faith given to some believers. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9, for example, Paul says that to another person, the Holy Spirit gives faith. Now, uh, a number of people have read the life of George Mueller, for example, and they have discovered that um, uh, Mueller prayed down by faith, a great man of faith, literally tens of thousands of dollars, in fact, several million dollars in the 1880s, and this was a time when a dollar really meant a dollar, really equaled a dollar, and he did it without asking any single businessman for one penny. And we're told that uh, D.L. Moody heard about that, and uh, he, of course, had gone around asking businessmen for money and to build the Moody Bible Institute and other uh, parts of his ministry, and he thought, well, maybe maybe I'm doing it the wrong way. And so he visited when he went to England. We're told he wanted to go there for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to see and meet and pray with Charles Haddon Spurgeon, pastor of the famous uh, Spurgeon's Tabernacle over there, and he wanted to meet with George Mueller. Well, he had a chance to do both, and Mueller told him, he said, Moody, don't try to do the things I do my way. He said, uh, God has led me to do things the way I do it. And he said, he's given me this stewardship faith. But he said, God has used you to do things that I could not do. You are to go to businessmen, Christian businessmen. And you see, when Moody did that, and then they gave, they could exercise their gift of giving. See, the businessmen could, but, but Moody was sort of relieved to find out that he wasn't called upon to do that. And so uh, a student sometimes will read this and say, well, you know, uh, I'm not to ask uh, the church for a raise, of, you know, as a pastor, or I'm not to let my known uh, needs be known as a, as a missionary. Does this mean I should not go out and, and conduct deputation meetings? Because after all, if I have this kind of faith, I wouldn't have to do it. That's true. If you did, you probably wouldn't. But God doesn't give every single believer this kind of faith. If you have it, then you better use it. But if you don't, then you better not. The gift of faith. And then the gift of evangelism. And this is definitely a gift. In Ephesians 4, Paul speaks, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. But let me hasten to say, uh, even before I describe this gift, that this does not, well, let me describe it and then make the statement. The gift of evangelism, I believe, is this, the supernatural ability to point sinners to Christ and to burden Christians about soul winning. Now, here's a statement I need to make. All believers 
are to witness for Christ, whether they have this special gift or not. Now, this, this does not mean that here's a person that can say, uh, who could say perhaps, uh, I can honestly claim, as far as I know, I do not have this gift. And that means that I should not witness. Absolutely not. Nothing could be further from the truth. Even though you don't have the gift of evangelism, we are commanded, every single person, we are commanded to be a soul witnesser, as I said before, to witness, to give a reason, the Bible says. Let every man be able to give a reason for the hope that's within him. But there are those, there's no doubt about it, who have a supernatural ability to win people to Christ. I think of the former soul-winning director here, J.O. Grooms, and some of the, the conversations that, uh, and then Dr. Jack Kyles at, at uh, First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana, and other pastors and soul winners that I know have the gift. Now, I've had the privilege of leading hundreds of people to Christ, but I don't think that is my particular gift. My gift is in other areas. I try to witness wherever I can, but, but these men simply just, they always know what to say. And they just go in there and, and, and get the job done. They have the gift of evangelism. All right, these basically then are the gifts. Well, actually, I should speak about the final one here, one of the most important, certainly one very close to my heart, the gift of the pastor-teacher. And that is the supernatural ability to preach and teach the Word of God and to feed and lead the flock of God. Notice this is the only double portion gift of the 18 gifts. He calls some, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 11, he gave some apostles, the gift of apostles, apostleship, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And the word and connects these two together. That, that is to say, every pastor should be a teacher. Now there is a gift of teaching, so that does not mean that every teacher has to be a pastor because there are two different gifts here. There is the gift of teaching, and then there is the gift of pastor teaching. So every pastor, though, should be a teacher. And I've heard pastors say, well, you know, I, I let my wife teach the adult Bible class. Of course, that's probably wrong in itself. Uh, or I'll let my deacon do this because I don't have the gift of teaching. Uh, well, uh, pastor, if you're called to be a pastor, you just haven't exercised that gift. You may be a better preacher than a teacher, but if you have the gift of pastoring, you also have the gift of teaching. And I just don't think you can be a very good pastor until you develop the gift of teaching. So every pastor should be a teacher also. Not every teacher, of course, is called to be a pastor. They are different gifts in that area. Um, I feel that God definitely gave me the gift of the pastor-teacher, and for some 18 years I exercised that, and then uh, I realized uh, that he also gave me uh, the gift of teaching in and by itself. And so I have been with Thomas Road now for some four years. Uh, someone said, you know, uh, who knew me when I was in the pastorate and then who knows me down here now, said, when you were in the pastorate, you were a teaching preacher, and now down here you are a teaching, you are a preaching teacher. <laughs> well, I guess I can't help myself. I, uh, I'm attempting to do the job the only way I know how to do it. So, these then are the basic gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the final lecture, that is to say the final part of this lecture, on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul and other passages describe what we're going to say next in a way that I would like, that I could not say, and I'd like to quote. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 22, he says, But now, speaking of believers, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. In Romans 7, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. 
All right, Colossians 1.10 speaks of this, that ye might walk worthy in the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Our final discussion now, the fruit of the Spirit. Let me discuss now the commands to bear fruit. God desires his new creation, that's believers, to do the same as he ordered his old creation to do. Remember Genesis 1 verse 28, God blessed uh, those that he made, Adam and Eve, and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Be fruitful. God said that to the man that he created. And his wife. Now, when God recreates a man in the image of Christ, he saves him. He says the same command, be fruitful. God created Adam for one purpose, to be fruitful. God saves a man today for one purpose, to be fruitful. And God desires that the believer will be able to fulfill the prophecy concerning Joseph in the Old Testament. Jacob prophesied about Joseph. He says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. Joseph overspreads himself, and people are blessed by the fruit of Joseph's ministry. And God desires the believer to produce fruit. All right, now, the prerequisites for bearing fruit. And by the way, we'll discuss this a little later on, but perhaps I better define what kind of fruit I'm talking about now, then I'll clarify it a little later. Apparently, there are two kinds of fruit that the Bible speaks about. Number one is the fruit of the Spirit. These were inward qualities. We'll discuss them pretty soon. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, etc. These are inward fruits. And then there is also the outward fruit, which is soul-winning. Inward fruit of Christ-likeness, the believers to bear that. The outward fruit of soul-witnessing, uh, and that's what the Lord Jesus speaks about in, in uh, John chapter 4. And that's also commanded. So there's a two-fold definition of fruit here. And the Holy Spirit and this is his final ministry, he desires to bear fruit in the life of the believer. Now, how do you do this? Well, number one, one must die to this world. John 12, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So, uh, D.L. Moody had uh, something to say about this. He said, This book will keep me from sin, as he wrote in his Bible, or sin will keep me from this book. And no believer can remain close to God and bear fruit and still be alive and associated in an intimate way with this, with this worldly system. Now, we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. So, must, so one must be separated from the world, as that grain of wheat was separated. It must die to the world. I don't mean going to the Alps and living in a monastery. Uh, you can die to the world living in downtown Chicago in the loop amidst the thousands of people. You can minister to those people, but you do not need to be influenced by the worldly system those people live in. That's what the Bible's talking about. He must die to the worldly philosophy, to the Hugh Hefner playboy world, you see. All right, secondly, he must abide in the Savior. If he wants to bear fruit, he's got to die to the world, but then even more important, he has to abide in the Savior. He has to be separated from the world to the Lord. And one is not any good without the other. Jesus brings us out in John 15, the first five verses. I am the true vine, he said, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, he says, Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. In order to bear fruit, whether it's inward or outward fruit, 
one must die to this world and one must abide in Christ. In the Old Testament, the nation Israel was God's chosen vine vessel to bear fruit. He could have picked the Philistines or the Egyptians or the Greeks or the Romans or whatever, but he chose the Israeli people to bear fruit. In fact, in Psalm 80, uh, David speaks about this. He said, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. He cast out the heathen out of the land of Palestine, and he planted his vine. Israel was to bear fruit. But, of course, the sad story here is that Israel did not bear fruit. Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, the prophet says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. And later on, one of the saddest things our Lord would do while he was on this earth, he would uh, set aside that fruitless vineyard, that fig tree, for a while. Read about this in Matthew 21, verse 43. Jesus said to a group of Pharisees, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Speaking of the Gentiles now. He said, I gave you all kinds of time and opportunity to bear fruit. You didn't bear fruit. I'll take your opportunity away for a while. Thank God he'll give that back during the tribulation and the millennium. But Israel now has been set aside officially by God as far as bearing fruit. Now, in the gospel account, the Lord Jesus was God's chosen vine while he was on this earth. He did that thing that Israel refused to do, would not do. Isaiah chapter uh, 53, verse 2, brings this out. He said, For he, speaking of Christ, the prophet is, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root of a dry ground. And then some of the last words that our Savior said as he preached to his disciples right before he was crucified in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. And so Jesus then was God's true vine, bearing fruit constantly the 34 years that he was on this earth. Now, our Lord left this earth, and he has another plan whereby he may find fruit. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the Gospel account, it was the Lord Jesus himself. But now, the believer of all races, all creeds, or that is to say former creeds, before they get saved, they are to bear fruit. In the present dispensation since Pentecost, the believer is to be God's vine branch vessel. All right? Now, how are we to do this? Number one, we are submit to pruning. Vineyard owners have to prune their crops yearly. And God prunes us, as it were. Hebrews 12, we're told, Concerning this pruning, verse 11, Now no chastening, no pruning, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised by them. And this pruning and purifying process is absolutely vital to fruit bearing according to Jesus. It will result in fruit, and then he says, more fruit, much fruit, and permanent fruit. He said, you have not chosen me, chapter 15, verse 16, the Gospel of John, but I have chosen you and ordained you, ordained you that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you shall ask in my name, my, ask of the Father in my name, I will give it you. Now, Jesus told his disciples uh, during that midnight walk on his way to Calvary, right before he crossed the Kedron Brook in John 15, that they were to be branches. He said, look, fellas, this is my last message. Listen carefully. I am the vine, and you're the branch. You're the branches. Now, the only useful function of a branch is to bear fruit. That's all that you can use a branch for. A branch does not produce fruit. It simply bears it. Again, we are not to win souls. We are to witness to souls 
God does the winning. You see, branches are never used for the building of boats. How would you like to uh, brave the dangerous, treacherous waters of the North Atlantic from here to Europe uh, in a branched uh, and a boat made of branches. Uh, thank you, I'd rather fly myself, and I don't like flying. No, branches are never used for building of boats or houses or furniture. Did you ever hear of a branch wood coffee table? No. Or a branch cedar chest, uh, or a branch chest, I guess I should say, instead of cedar chest. No, branches are not used for furniture, and they're not even used for firewood. They just burn up like that. A branch exists, therefore, for one sole purpose, to bear fruit. And as we've already said now, there are two kinds of fruit mentioned. There is the outer fruit, which is soul winning or soul witnessing, and there's the inner fruit, which is Christ likeness. In John chapter 4, Jesus speaks of the outer fruit that the believer is to bear for the Lord Jesus. Uh, they had gone into the city to buy some food, and he was out there on Jacob's well, of course, and he had a chance to lead the Samaritan woman, woman to Christ, and she had gone back another direction to the city and uh, was bringing back a group of individuals to hear about the one who had just saved her. And then the disciples came back, and they offered him food, and he said, No, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And then he happened to look up, and he saw this Samaritan woman coming with the whole town, and she's bringing, come on out, fellows and ladies, I want you to hear about a man who told me everything ever I did. And our Lord saw that, and he said, Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Isn't that what you're saying? Four months, and then the harvest comes. Speaking, of course, the harvest crop there at Palestine. But he said, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look over there in the horizon, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And there he was speaking about the fruit of soul witnessing. Paul said one of the reasons he wanted to go to Rome to see them, he says, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul wanted to be able to win some of them, or at least point some of them to Christ, the Romans, as he had done the Macedonians and the Ephesians and the Philippians and the Thessalonians and some of the rest. All right, now, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, the Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So that's outward fruit, and that's what God wants to bear in us as branches. Now, there is an inner fruit mentioned, and that's Christ's likeness has nothing to do with soul witnessing. It leads to that, but it's a different kind of fruit. And nevertheless, it is the fruit mentioned here. Of course, our passage there is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, it should be noted that the word in Galatians here is in the singular. Paul does not say the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. That's probably the way we'd say it today. But rather this, the fruit of the Spirit is. And here's the reason. All the fruit of the Spirit, unlike all the gifts of the Spirit, are to be possessed by every believer today. Now, to clarify this, I want you to consider the following illustration. Let's visualize an apple orchard and a grape vineyard. And the official name of the orchard is the Gifts of the Spirit Orchard. Okay? And the name of the vineyard is the Fruit of the Spirit Vineyard. Now, here's a sinner. He gets saved. And so the Spirit of God now ushers the sinner into both these fields, that of the grapes and that of the apples. As they enter the orchard, that's the Fruit of the Spirit Orchard, of course, uh, the, I'm sorry, that's the Gifts of the Spirit Orchard, named. The Christian notices 18 apples hanging from each tree. And the Holy Spirit then explains to the Christian that these are his various gifts to the believer. And he thereupon picks a few, but not all the apples, from the tree, and he hands them to the Christian. When the Lord saved me, took me into this vineyard, he said, okay, now, or he took me into this uh, orchard, which was the fruit or the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, look at these 18 apples. And he said, all right, Wilmington, I'm going to give you a few here, put in your pocket, and you can use them later on. 
Here's the, uh, here's the gift of preaching and teaching. And here's another. Here's the gift of teaching. And some have told me I perhaps have a part of the gift of exhortation. If I do, then I've got that apple also. Here's the gift of, of uh, exhortation. And so I go out of there uh, with three or four apples in my pocket. I don't get all of them, but I get some of them. All right, now, the next stop is to the vineyard. We've been to the fruit or to the gifts of the spirit orchard and now the fruit of the spirit vineyard. And here the Christian notices identical clusters of grapes hanging from the vines. Every grape cluster has love, joy, peace, etc. So the spirit of God then tells the believer that each cluster contains so many grapes which go to make up the fruit of the spirit. And before leaving the vineyard, the new Christian is handed an entire cluster with the explanation that it is Christ's divine plan for every child of God to possess some of the apples, but all of the grapes. Now, don't you ever, as a child of God, say, well, you know, I don't, uh, I have this problem of hatred in my heart, and I guess I can't love everybody. Uh, or uh, I just don't have any self-control, but that's not one of my gifts. Well, if you're saved, God desires that you have all the fruit of the Spirit, you see. And so uh, if you're appointed to be a Sunday school teacher and you just can't teach, and it's uh, pretty obvious to the students you can't teach, you might be able to go to the pastor and say, well, now look, uh, I just don't have the gift of teaching. And maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. See, you, mean, you might not have that apple. But don't you ever say, I can't love because I don't have uh, the fruit of the Spirit when it comes to love. If you're saved, you've got all the grapes. You may not be using them, friend, but you've got them all. Now let's notice here some of the uh, little grapes on this uh, fruit of the Spirit. Number one, the fruit of the Spirit is love. In your notes, of course, you'll see there are a number of kinds of love in the Bible. There is a stergon love. That's a gravitational love, the love that... Uh, that a cub would have for its, uh, or that we might say that a cat would have for its kittens, is sort of a gravitational love. And uh, then there's another kind of love, it's called eros. That's not found in the Greek New Testament, but that's a sexual, a passionate, and often a lustful and a perverted love. The word eros to name means uh, erotic, means one that, something that stimulates for sexual passion. The word eros is a lustful sexual love. It is not found in the New Testament. Stergon is on two occasions. Eros is not. Then there's phileo. Oh, that's a friendly, a beautiful love. It's a human love, but it's a love that J David had for Jonathan, etc. And then there is another kind of love, and that is a divine love, an agapeo or an agape love. And this love is found only in God. And this love is different from all other, from the Stergon or Eros and Phileo love, because it is not dependent upon the beauty of the object being loved. It is found 320 times in the Greek New Testament, but rarely found in classical writings. The reason being that uh, men like Homer and uh, Euripides and the rest didn't use it too much because they weren't quite sure how it should be used. And, uh, but this is a divine love, and I have a little illustration here about a housewife that uh, finds this little mouse, and she picks the mouse up and uh, places a beautiful little ribbon around its neck and perfumes it and washes it, feeds it, and then she carries this little rodent around next to her bosom. Well, you'd say that's ridiculous. There's nothing in the existence of that miserable little mouse that would cause the woman to do that. We can understand the housewife as she loves her child because she sees her child in her, she sees herself in her child, or why she should love her husband because her loves, husband, of course, provides for her. But what would this, this uh, mangy little mouse be able to do for her? Obviously nothing. She would simply have to say, I'm going to love that mouse because I've just decided to love it. It's, not, it's unlovely, but I'm just going to love it. And, of course, that's agapeo love. That's the love that God had for the world. This love is never found in the heart of man prior to the ascension of Christ. Um, this is the love, however, that is found 
in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I'm going to ask the good brother who makes this tape to tell me how much time I have, and he says five minutes. All right, this will be the final tape that I've made this semester, and I think I'll go out and celebrate with a cup of coffee or something, but I have these five minutes left. Uh, 64 tapes were my lot to make this semester, and I'll be making, of course, others in the days to come, but uh, how I've enjoyed making this. Let me just say that as a child of God, you have the agapeo love shed abroad in your hearts, and you can love the unlovely. You may not like everybody, but you are to love everybody. You said, I can't. Yes, you can. Let me give you a definition of this agapeo love. Agapeo love is the, how shall we say this, is the act of one person seeking the highest good for another person. It is unselfish concern for the welfare of somebody else. And that guy that you work with at the factory or that housewife that you live next to, and you just can't stand them. Maybe you don't like them. Maybe you wouldn't always go over and drink coffee with them. But you can love them by praying for them and trying to be the best help you can to their lives. It's the act of one person seeking the highest good for another person. That is love. And that's the love that's shed abroad in our hearts through the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer today can love Jesus in a way that even Simon Peter could not love him in, Acts, uh, in John chapter 20. Remember, we ha uh, you'll read it in your notes here, where uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And he says, as a play on Greek words, he said, do you, do you agapeo me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. He said, no, do you agapeo me? Lord, you know I phileo you. And Jesus said, well, all right, I'll go along with you, Simon. Do you, do you phileo me? And he said, Lord, you know I phileo you. See, he couldn't really love him with an agapeo love until Acts chapter 2. What happened at Acts 2? Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. And then in Romans 5, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our hearts the love of God. So I can love Jesus in the way that Simon could not until Pentecost took place. So the first is love. And then the Bible speaks of the love and then joy. And that's another. And you can pretty well read this for yourself here. Uh, another aspect of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is peace. And this is the peace of God, not the peace with God but the peace of God that only filled believers, spirit-filled believers can produce. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, the ability to cheerfully bear an unbearable situation and to patiently endure the unendurable. And then gentleness, you can read these passages for yourself, gentleness and faith, and then after that righteousness, and after that, as we go through our notes here, uh, temperance and various other fruit of the Spirit. I want to close these eight tapes with the following poem written about the Holy Spirit, entitled, The Comforter Has Come. Oh, spread the tidings round. Wherever man is found, wherever human heart and human woes abound, let every Christian tongue Proclaim the joyful sound. The Comforter has come. The long, long night is past. The morning breaks at last and hush the dreadful wail and fury of the blast as over the golden hills the day advances fast. The Comforter has come. O oh, boundless love divine. That's the fruit of the Spirit. How shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell the matchless grace divine that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine, the Comforter has come. And all this chorus, the Comforter has come, the Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. He came, dear friend, for one reason, to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to produce in the believer the very purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God allow you and me as teacher and student to experience the love of God and the communion of the saints through the Holy Spirit is my prayer. 
God bless you. Amen. This is the final lecture in the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. You may now take your final exam. This exam will be found in the final exam packet and should be taken in the presence of your proctor.